Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, more updates on the situation in Ukraine and how it impacts U.S. defense posture. We talked to a former chief of naval operations about the view from Kyiv. And we check out new tech that allows troops to talk to combat robots. And the robots talk back. Plus, the Air Force is looking at how it can pair drones with unmanned combat flights. And who is Iraq trying to buy tanks from? We take a look. Finally, on a lighter note, a conversation with Channing Tatum on his new movie about an army ranger and a troubled military working dog. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon. This is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. First, a note about the news concerning Ukraine. At the time of our taping, the situation was still very fluid and changing by the hour. But Russia had not advanced into the former Soviet Republic. As the tension on the Ukrainian border increased this week, Military Times' senior managing editor Howard Altman spoke to a former Ukrainian military official in Kyiv about the situation. Here's part of that conversation. How ready are the Russians to attack from Crimea to Mariupol and that coastal area? How ready are they at this point? In total, they can they can concentrate, I would say, from a certain amount of troops. But I would say probably the most probably they will they will uh, they will advance if they advance from 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 uh, from land side, just alongside. When you say through, through Crimea? Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Also, Crimea and from Russia, from both sides. From Russia, to so come yeah, Russia yeah. and then down yeah. and then Crimea yeah. up. And, yeah. how, and, and how ready are they? Can they do that now? Are they ready to go now? Uh, I believe at least they're in the places. I would say they're in the places, initial positions, and they're already for quite a while ago. Yeah. And, and how many Russian troops are in Crimea right now? Uh, right now, uh, around 30, 34,000 troops. 34,000, which is an increase from yes, earlier. Yes, yes it, it's increased, and, and, and you see that they all over the time are rotating them, and, and, and now they, they concentrated them like mobile, mobile troops, airborne. What's your sense of when the Putin can attack, can launch a major attack anywhere at this point? What's your assessment of when that could happen? Yeah, the, the most probably, uh, yeah, actually I agree it will be like, like three areas for simultaneous attack. Uh, first attack, it will be from, from, from west, from Donbass. Yeah, second will be from south, from, from Crimea. And third attack will be from, 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 from top, from north, Kiev and Zhytomyr, from Belarus. Belarus. When do you think Putin might attack? I really don't know because because now you see this is an I would say uh, his his units already probably very close to the full operational capability to run attack. Uh, but now I would say because of this political pressure, because U.S., because U.K., because NATO, uh, yeah, I mean because France, because Germany, obviously it's some kind of talks. But anyway, everybody say to him what you do. Why you why you decide to attack Ukraine? What what is what is guilty of Ukraine actually? Why you would like to to kill people, thousands of people, and also, yeah, this this is this is and also sanctions and this probably um, somehow stop him. Uh, and this is uh, I really don't know when but when it's gonna happen. But as as more like international community and diplomacy push Putin and try to. To discuss as um, uh, as uh, uh, less, I would say probably probable. This this is south. Thanks, Howard. 
for up-to-the-minute coverage of the situation and what it means for U.S. forces, head to MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. Up next, as robots become more of a part of the military toolkit, developers are researching ways for troops to better communicate with them. What if you could talk to your combat robot like it was Siri or Alexa? And what if it could talk back? Todd South looks at developing the idea in this week's Mil Tech. Have you ever wanted to use Siri or Alexa, but for combat? Well, Army scientists are working on that. Essentially what they've done is taken large data sets, a whole bunch of different algorithm work, and created a way for soldiers to talk to robots or talk to artificial intelligence that would use voice commands and also answer questions. But the new innovation they've come up with in just recent months is that the robot is able to ask questions of the soldier. Now a robot asking questions of the soldier seems a little counterintuitive. I mean, you don't have to have Alexa or Siri ask you questions. But they have massive data sets, big cloud-based systems, and the entire internet to pull from. They're not really working in a localized environment. They're really working off of the data sets they have in their databases. So when you're out in an austere conditions or in a field operation or on a mission, a robot in the future will have to basically gather information about what's around it. So when you ask it to get a certain tool or an item, it might ask a clarifying question, like what color is that? What size is it? What is it used for? So the scientists doing this work are with the Army's uh, Development Command, or DEVCOM, also the Army Research Lab, the Naval Research Laboratory, Tufts University, and a whole collaboration of universities that are research universities that work with the Department of Defense. The program in its current iteration is called Human Robot Dialogue Learning. That's the most recent version of the robots asking questions of the soldier, uh, but it also built on past work, previous projects in recent years that have really built up that whole data set and also built the algorithms to make this thing work. One of the earlier programs back in 2020, seems like forever ago, was JUDI, Joint Understanding Dialogue Interface. Now that was kind of a building block to the HURDLE program. Now both are laboratory-based experiments, and even though HURDLE has seen some successes, it has not really been used in an operational environment. One of the problems there is going to be background noise, other environmental noise, that the system is going to have to distinguish that from the voice of the soldier, so it's getting exactly the information it needs or it wants for the particular task it's assigned. So what might this soldier-robot dialogue look like? Well, to me, it kind of sounds a little bit like a kid asking a lot of questions when you're telling them to clean your, their room. <laughs> so essentially what they've done is they've laid out some example questions that they use in the laboratory as part of the release they sent out to announce this project. And what the Army's essentially doing is walking into very specific questions, very specific sets. So for example, the soldier, move to the Delta platform. Robot, where is the Delta platform? Soldier, it's in the middle on the set of three. Robot, okay. Now for something a little more specific. Soldier. Pick up the optimized synthesizer. I don't even know what that is. Robot. What does the optimized synthesizer look like? Soldier. Synthesizers are measurement tools with a number display and a dial. There are three of them. Robot. Is it blue? <laughs> Soldier. Yes. Robot. What do I do with it? Soldier. Move it to the primary cabinet. Robot. Then what? Place the optimized synthesizer on shelf B. So you can see it has to be very specific, very detail oriented to get those questions in line. But hopefully with machine learning over time, those same AI programs and robots will have to ask fewer questions because they'll understand the intent of what the soldier wants to get done. So the soldier robot dialogue is just one of many programs the Army's working on now with machine learning, algorithms, artificial intelligence, really aiming for the day when robots are embedded and ubiquitous across different types of soldier formations, out in the field, in the laboratory, in garrison, and soldiers will be working with them basically like battle buddies and talking to them like they would a fellow soldier. So one of the another research initiatives they're doing is taking this stuff, stuff together, putting it all into one format, trying to get it out to the field as quickly as possible. But there are a lot of hurdles. Basically, the laboratory setting is where they start these projects. Um, it could be a few years before we see this really fielded and out with soldiers. Although soldiers could be testing and playing with this in the near future in different testing and experimentation formats. With Military Times, this is Todd South. The United States Air Force wants pilots to have autonomous wingmen to fight future wars. Air Force reporter Stephen Losey has been covering this story and joined me earlier.
Steven, welcome to the show. Thanks, glad to be here. Tell us about the Air Force plans to, to pair up manned aircraft with unmanned aircraft. The Air Force is trying to flesh out a new vision for air operations right now. It's one where pilots fly into combat with a team of autonomous drones by their side. These drone wingmen that top Air Force leaders are envisioning, they could do multiple things. They could scout ahead and find targets. They could jam enemy signals, maybe even launch their own missiles. Now, this is something the Air Force has been looking at for a while. For example, they have, they've had a uh, Skyborg program that is an AI wingman program that had a test flight in a drone last April. And the Australians, the Royal Australian Air Force, has been experimenting with their loyal wingman program, which is kind of a similar deal. They're trying to take some lessons from it. But recently, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall has been talking more and more about this, and he thinks this could work. He thinks it's not just a crazy idea, as he said. And wh why are they even looking at this technology? Well, for the last 20 years, the Air Force has been uh, conducting operations in the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and the airspace has been pretty much uncontested, meaning they haven't had to deal with enemy fighters, they haven't had to deal with uh, air defenses, things like that. But now the military is preparing for a high-end fight, a, a potential battle against a peer or a near-peer adversary, such as China or Russia. And if worse were to come to worse and a conflict with those nations were to break out, those nations have a lot more uh, air defenses, a lot more fighters, a lot, the, the airspace would be greatly contested and pilots would be at risk. What the Air Force is hoping for is to have these, uh, these unmanned drone wingmen extend the pilot's reach and um, take on some of the tasks that the pilots uh, wouldn't have to do. Where are they right now? What's a snapshot of the, of the U.S. Air Force's capability with this? Well, right now it's just been in this kind of a experimental phase. I mentioned the Skyborg program that they've been using to figure out whether AI wingmen could work. Uh, DARPA has been experimenting with a program called Gremlins, where they've been proving that they can uh, reach out and capture a drone in flight. So there's there's been a couple of programs that are um, uh, that they've experimented with, but we'll see uh, in the near future whether this um, spells out to the Air Force expanding some of these efforts. And talking about expanding and, and personnel-wise, is it going to take more people to do this on the ground? Um, I'm not sure if it would take more people on the ground. It's um, right now it it'll it'll be a um, they'll, they'll have to do more research to figure out. There are a lot of things that still have yet to be determined. For instance, what payloads these drones might carry, how the pilots might control them, how to deploy them. Uh, Secretary Kendall has talked about um, the, these unmanned wingmen running plays and the pilot would be kind of a quarterback. What kind of plays would these uh, drones run? These are all questions that have to be, um, have to be sorted out. And let's move over to another story that you have with Lockheed Martin. They decided not to move forward on a controversial buy. Yes. Lockheed Martin, since uh, December 2020, has been uh, working on trying to acquire Aerojet Rocketdyne. Last month, the uh, Federal Trade Commission sued to block the uh, Lockheed Aerojet acquisition on antitrust grounds. Uh, there were concerns that uh, if Lockheed acquired Aerojet, that it could limit competition. It would uh, make it harder for um, competitors to acquire some of the uh, things like rocket engines that Aerojet um, provides. And um, the FTC raised antitrust concerns. Just this past weekend, Lockheed announced that they had decided to terminate the deal and no longer go forward with it. And Lockheed Martin CEO Jim Takelet did say that it could be that they would be efficient if they if they brought in Aerodyne, it they would be an efficient uh, company that would provide to to throughout the defense industry. What did he mean by that? Yeah, that was uh, Lockheed's uh, explanation of how they felt this would benefit. Lockheed argued that they would bring Aerojet's engineering operations, for example, under their own uh, umbrella, and by combining efforts, 
they said things would operate a lot more smoothly and save costs by bringing everything um, in one operation. Um, you know, they, they expressed regret that it didn't go forward. They said a lot of good could have come of that. The FTC disagreed and uh, that was kind of the end of that acquisition, it seems. It seems there's a lot of eyes on Aerojet right now. Why is it in demand right now? They make a lot of vital missile components, most notably pr propulsion equipment, such as scramjet engines for hypersonic missiles and control systems for missile interceptors. Well, Steve, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. And now for defense dollars. Iraq is shopping for defense systems and it's looking at different countries for jets, drones, and tanks. The Iraqi Ministry of Defense is expected to send a delegation to inspect French drones. France is offering up 20 of them, and Pakistan has also offered to sell 20 drones to Iraq. The Iraqi Air Force is also looking to purchase some 14 French Rafale fighter jets. The nation's army is also looking at T-90 tanks from Russia. It ordered 73 of them in 2016 and also operates M1 Abrams tanks. And coming up, it's tax season and tax scam season. Our personal finance expert has tips on, on how to keep your information safe. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack tells you how to spot and to avoid tax scams. There's no better welcome to the new year than your long-awaited tax refund. With so many expecting a deposit of cash, it's no wonder that during this time, tax scams also tend to spike. Phishing, identity theft, and perhaps even a dishonest tax preparer are all things you need to protect yourself against. Keep a lookout for unusual activity like folks contacting you, posing as the IRS. The IRS will never contact you over the phone, email, text, or through social media. So this is definitely a scam. Don't respond or click on any links. Instead, visit irs.gov and report it. And if you're hiring someone to help prepare your taxes, make sure they're qualified and have a good reputation. Check out the tax preparer directory on irs.gov to find a tax preparer with bona fide credentials. And do file your taxes as early as possible. That way, there's less of a chance for scammers to try and file in your name. If you file online, use a secure internet connection to protect your personal information. Staying on top of all the ways fraudsters try to take your identity and your money will get you through tax season and onto enjoying your tax refund safely. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you again soon. In the meantime, to get more of our coverage, click on over to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for the latest headlines. And for a list of the biggest military and defense stories each weekday in your inbox, sign up for our early bird brief. And head over to our channels on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for more multimedia coverage. When we come back, Channing Tatum talks about his latest project, in which he plays an army ranger on an unusual mission. Welcome back. In a new movie just reaching theaters, actor Channing Tatum plays an army ranger with a mission to deliver a troubled military working dog to her former handler's funeral. Tatum recently spoke with HistoryNet's Claire Barrett about the film. Check it out. What are y'all so scared of? She's mellowed out big time. <laughs> so I just want to start off, obviously this film is about a myriad of things, mainly that of the bond between, you know, man and dog, but I want to pivot a little bit away from that and talk about, you know, how important was it for both of you to accurately portray, you know, military culture which I think you kind of nailed in the scene with Bill Burr and the MP um, that definitely made you laugh. <laughs> we do, I, look, so I did a, I did a movie at uh, <laughs> Jump Street where we play bike cops and I, yeah. I'm always like scared that I'm gonna run into a bike cop oh, and, yeah. like, and like- And get a whooping. <laughs> and, like, yeah, and get a beaten. <laughs> like, but like, gonna I'm happen. sure all the MPs in the military are gonna hate us after this movie, but, uh, but yes, I mean, we, Look, it, we just took them straight from the horse's mouth in a way. We, yeah. We're friends with a lot of 
uh, military servicemen, specifically in the teams uh, like Rangers and, and such. And like, we did a documentary called War Dog on these multi-purpose uh, canines, like the high level, and and their and their handlers and like that bond and and uh, it, it's a it's a beautiful doc if you you should see it if you haven't. And those guys kind of just became these like incredible characters in our life that we we just sort of became obsessed with, and we had a chance to sort of meld an experience that I had in my life with that world, and um, and we just took the chance and and tried to do it as you know, as honestly and as accurate as possible without, you know, I, I think both of us were really not, we were a little over like the sad soldier movie in a way. And, yeah. and like, yes, there is sad stories everywhere, especially in the military and there, and there's a lot to like have to handle inside of that world that, you know, lots of, there's a giant spectrum of, of service men and women, and they all have different experiences. And, um, I, I don't know. I didn't want to play a, a person that hated the military or hated their experience in it. And I wanted to play someone that kind of was indicative to the people that we were hanging out with. And they were like, it was, loved it. It was, love, it was awesome and rad. Yes, there is, you know, there's the things that aren't exactly the most fun, but, um, you know, they wanted, they, they're still in, they're still serving. They're still like getting to do really rad things. And, and, uh, but that doesn't come without, you know, uh, you know, a, a, I guess a cause and effect thing. Yeah. And, um, these are two characters like the, you know, our dog in the movie and, and Briggs are at like a transition moment in their life that they have to like really start to making, you know, some very interesting decisions. And I, and look, we had the Rangers on set with us. We had a, a group of Rangers from our documentary and some other Rangers uh, that we got to know afterwards on set with us. They're going to be on our you know, yeah, we're USO, going on a tour. USO tour. That's going to be bonkers. Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> going to go to Fort Benning and you know, go to Ranger Battalion and stuff. And, I, and look, I, I think that was something for us that was, you know, sort of paramount to, to uh, I mean, maybe even making the movie itself. Like it was getting that culture really right and making sure that the people in the culture signed off on it. And it wasn't us projecting our values on on them, but but really them being able to speak for themselves. And Brett Rodriguez was uh, our producer and co-wrote the story with us. He served in the Army, in the infantry, in the 10th Mountain Division for um, a while, and then became a contractor. And so he really kind of opened this community to to us and, and, and made a marriage really between us that where there was a comfort and a trust that was built. And that became just increasingly important to us to, to make sure they had a voice every stage of the, of the process. Well, thank you guys. You nailed the, definitely made me laugh. You nailed the culture on that for sure. <laughs> Good. So thanks. Thank that you makes so it much better. for taking the time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate you very much for what you do. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.